This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Pauline Carr and I'm the Chancellor of the University of South Australia. I'm immensely pleased to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Tonight, we're going to hear from Craig Foster AM as he delivers the 2002 UniSA Nelson Mandela Lecture. But before we begin, I would like to ask Senior Kana Elder, Uncle Lewis Yalaburka O'Brien, to deliver the Welcome to Country. Marwijanga, Yana Mian and Iwangani, Mani Nabudni Gani Yatana. Nibiriko, Mankalakala, Tandanya, Mianaku. Nature Yungandalia, Nature Yakanandalia, Padni Adlu Wadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do this ambassador of the Adelaide Plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. There was a little girl drawing in the corner in the schoolroom, and the teacher went up to her and said, what are you drawing, dear? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. <gasps> Oh dear, we don't know what God looks like. The girl looked at her and said, you will in a minute? <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Lewis. I would like to warmly welcome tonight's special guests, our speaker, Craig Foster AM, Professor David Lloyd, Vice-Chancellor of the University of South Australia, and welcome all of you here tonight to this evening's lecture. I'd also like to thank Jacinta Thompson, Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, which is located at the University of South Australia, and also I'd like to thank her team. The Nelson Mandela Lecture Series was established in honour of the world's, one of the world's greatest humanitarian figures, the late Mr Nelson Mandela, as an advocate of peace, reconciliation and social justice. Mr Mandela had strong links to UniSA. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by the university in 1998 and became the international patron of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, a position he held from 2001 to 2013. In his honour, the purpose of our Nelson Mandela Lecture Series is to promote the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals and the value of truth and reconciliation in life and public affairs. The ideal of justice for common humanity underpins all of the lectures presented. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Craig Foster, AM, former Socceroos captain and now human rights advocate to present the 2022 Nelson Mandela Lecture. This event was originally scheduled for last year, but was postponed because of COVID. So it's not only a great thrill to present Craig to you, it's equally wonderful that everyone is able to be here tonight and to hear him in person. Craig Foster's humanitarian activism extends to several high profile campaigns. Despite calls of togetherness and shared humanity, of the interconnected of everyone in society in Australia and around the world during the height of the pandemic, the pandemic uncovered staggering inequality. The burden of the pandemic falls disproportionately on women and frontline workers. That added to an under-resourced aged care sector, victimisation of the poor and minority groups, ongoing trauma and deaths in custody of First Nations peoples, a failure of parliamentary leaders to respond humanely to claims of sexual abuse and rape, and the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. It is clear that society does not work for far too many people. Tonight, Craig explores a new social bargain with human rights at its core. Please join me in welcoming Craig Foster as he delivers the 2002 UniSA Nelson Mandela Lecture. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I just want to uh, uh, say that it's uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, it took a long time and a number of attempts, but it's wonderful to come home to Adelaide, a place where I did live in the early 90s and played for the mighty Adelaide City Football Club. Anyone know the Adelaide City Football Club? Great. 
So I have many close friends here, of course, and wonderful memories. I know that you had graduation today, the university staff, so I'm going to do my utmost in the next few minutes to try and keep you awake. But if I see anyone nodding off in the front of this uh, audience here, beware. I'll be on to you straight away. Let's get underway. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, which was never ceded, and that the Uluru Statement is the manifestation of Indigenous Australia's inalienable right to self-determination. <clears throat> Having spent the past few years challenging some of Australia's deadly policy impacts on asylum seekers and refugees, and with recent welcome acceptance of the New Zealand resettlement offer and release from the Park Hotel in Melbourne of the remaining 30 Medivac refugees. I've seen many aspects of our political, social and cultural life that need seismic change in order to avoid the entire process again. And in the context of existential challenges such as climate change, it's going to take a new paradigm of lawmaking, certainly political discourse, and social inclusion if we're to act quickly enough to pivot to the new energy economy and particularly to retrain Australians. We'll briefly explore some of the drivers of our lack of progress on energy transition that are common to our selective lack of humanity and human rights transgressions tonight. And in the midst of an election, perhaps we might look at some of the present campaign commentary and policies that reflect the cynical nature of modern Australian political reality. I'm sure we'd all like to just move on from the ongoing, endless arguments about long settled science on climate or gender equality indigenous rights, or truth-telling in history class, to name just a few. My thesis tonight is that in an environment with damaging over-concentration of media and corporate influence on political parties, the only way to escape the interminable cycle of culture wars, gender wars, climate wars that clog our daily news cycle on issues that should be so straightforward is to embed a charter of rights into Australia's constitutional or legal framework and entrench basic protections for all. <clears throat> Importantly, this would free us all, restore dignity to many people, whether Australian or otherwise, and let us focus on the broader issues, including a vision for who we are and where we wish to be in 50 or 100 years. It's impossible to look up when all the screaming and division keeps our heads down and so many are hostage to emotions. Reason, restraint, sensitivity, consideration for others, thoughtfulness, and measured debate are required to solve some of the most complex and important challenges of our lifetimes. But sadly, we're stuck in damaging battles across racial, political, gender, religious, and economic lines. We need to find another way to have important conversations and a charter of rights would remove the space for so many banal arguments that are a waste of all our time and energy. Let us explore then some of the aspects of Australian life that would irrevoc irrevocably change for the better, underwritten by a commitment to the dignity of every person. Not a day goes by without more statistics on the avoidable deaths of elderly Australians from COVID, stories of the rise of those sleeping rough, homeless, of Australians needing charity just to eat tonight as food insecurity affects a growing segment of the population, and of Indigenous kids as young as 10 on the pipeline to a lifetime of incarceration. 
nor without the constant draining and damaging culture wars where public figures, politicians and media organisations try to drag Australia more to the right or the left on border policy, social welfare or human rights, whatever is in their commercial or political interests and never with a single thought for the people who are cannon fodder for this endless barrage. Just in recent weeks, a Liberal candidate in the seat of Warringah, pre-selected personally and supported by the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, attacked the transgender community under the guise of sport in a cynical, calculated, dangerous and bigoted move that places already vulnerable people, particularly children, who experience an extremely high suicide rate at risk. Supported by the Prime Minister, I remind you. With refugees rotting and dying on and off our shores, and another border scare election campaign well underway, where the shocking temporary visas that keep people in limbo and away from families for decades on end are being used to split the community again, it's important to understand that this whole cycle of demonization, division, marginalization and segregation is completely unnecessary. Aren't you tired of it? I know, I certainly am. And the concentration of media in too few hands is an issue that eats away at every principle of an open democratic society which should be a contest of ideas not only a promotion of them. I see little difference between state-owned media and a state captured by one. Throughout three significant, even existential issues in recent years, I've seen directly the corrosive impact, particularly of the News Limited agenda, and I'm really worried about where we are and where we're headed. Refugees and asylum seekers who were endlessly demonised and the linguistic infrastructure of boats and security injected into the public mind. The pandemic in which a great deal of misinformation polluted the public space, including and particularly from the Murdoch-led organisation. And of course, climate change. For too long, the climate debate has been dominated by ideology and extremism. It's been used as a political weapon wielded by power players and vested interests and people looking to make a buck, said Daily Telegraph editor Ben English in October last year, when News Limited made an editorial about face after decades of destruction of ideas and policy in the climate space. Exactly, Ben. I agree with you. When it comes to the issue of refugee torture and cruel, degrading and inhuman treatment under Australia's privatised, rich list inducing offshore prison system, the control of almost three quarters of the Australian media landscape has been a key factor in creating a social environment where many Australians have been perfectly willing to lock innocent people up for nine years. Why not? Why not? When we're constantly made to fear or hate innocent asylum seekers. When we're told they're everything from criminals to terrorists, sexual predators to welfare cheats. A constant stream of propaganda that has infected the entire country. I know this because in my advocacy work over the past few years, I speak to Australians of all ages and circumstances about the issue. And so many make the same flawed, false, but clearly deeply held 
accusations. Ideas they were taught to believe over decade after decade of indoctrination. It's all misinformation of one type or another. And whether for commercial, political or ideological gain, it's divisive and it infects the national psyche. When we constantly turn people against other, it's a very small step to turn on one another. Such as when Indian Australians were shamefully criminalised should they try to return home during COVID. That's staggering. But it's part of the same context. Whether it leads to Australians wanting to inject themselves with harmful substances to ward off the evil COVID virus, march the streets calling for the literal head of a state premier, leave humans rotting for years or keep uh, spewing CO2 into the atmosphere at the expense of our children and theirs, it's all part of the same process. If we are to talk about human rights and a better future, then media diversity laws are the first step on the path to genuine public interest journalism, political accountability and reason discussions. Several years ago, I went so far as to suggest to one of Australia's richest new generation that the greatest contribution they might make to the country and world, aside from paying their fair share of tax, <laughs> would, be, would be to purchase the Australian News Limited operations, place it in a national trust with a wholly independent board of trustees and restore independent journalism. That was a pretty short conversation. <laughs> but what a wonderful contribution that would be. In one stroke, I'd wager that we might restore our own sense of hope and goodness as well because the constant barrage of hate and discrimination against so many minorities, uh, from Sudanese youth to our First Nations, and the reconciliation that we need to heal the past has long-term effects on all of us. There is a path to a country where basic rights for all are a given and we can turn our attention and media commentary to more substantial issues, such as what our global contribution is other than churning out resources and how we can better leverage the brilliant capability that exists here in our humanity and the planet planet's interest. The Charter of Rights is not only a mechanism to embed basic rights into, into policy and law, but much needed to end this cycle of binary debate. Economy or people, borders or torture, social welfare or deficit Armageddon, <laughs> women or men. By entrenching basic protections, that means vulnerable people can rely on minimum services and mercifully stop being weaponized to divide. We might say that a charter of rights would underpin a new social bargain or contract, a centuries old concept of the agreement for the individual to submit to the authority of the state in return for protection of basic rights and maintenance of social and public order. And with so many Australians missing out and struggling with basic protections, it seems apt to explore some of the expectations we might have that not only must be provided for each of you, but crucially that the state and powerful media organisations could not undermine. The human rights impacts of climate change, for example, are increasingly being prosecuted as a human right around the world with over a thousand cases since 2015. From Germany's constitutional court to the important 2015 ruling by the Dutch courts that the Netherlands government had a duty of care to protect its citizens from
from climate change. In stark contrast to the recent federal court case in which the Australian government successfully avoided a duty of care to future generations of Australians, as remarkable as that is. With the capture of the major Australian political parties by the powerful fossil fuel lobby and media sowing climate confusion and government commitments and planning on as yet unproven technologies rather than a just transition plan, a broad commitment to a sustainable planet as a right for every Australian, whether at legal or constitutional level, makes perfect sense and would release us from this hell of the climate wars that we're still living through today. Would also take the issue out of the hands of environment ministers and place it in ours. It's our fundamental right to both live in and pass on a livable world and to expect our government to do everything in its power, with our money I might add, to ensure this is the case. Surely, above all else, that's part of today's social bargain, isn't it? While we're on taxpayer funds, I commend the Greens on their report of today into the lack of tax paid by major multinational gas companies. 217 gas corporations made $77 billion in income and paid no tax in recent years. And yet we argue about social welfare. We should expect that our governments protect the environment, cease funding the continuation of fossil fuel extraction with over $11 billion in subsidies this year alone that should be germinating the new renewable economy and maximise our children's opportunity to a sustainable climate in return for civil obedience, shouldn't we? On the right to protest. That right, even at the disturbance of infrastructure and industries, is a critical part of government being held accountable by the people. A right worryingly and increasingly being legislated away only very recently further in New South Wales. What are citizens to do, other than vote of course, when their planet is at risk and the world won't even pause to consider the demise of the Antarctic ice caps or the increase in devastating weather patterns even as Australia repeatedly burns and floods on catastrophic and record levels? We saw the right to protest stratified when Scott Morrison was highly critical of Black Lives Matter and the aligned Indigenous Lives Matter protest that he deemed dangerous and potentially a super spreading event, though held within public health laws and overwhelmingly masked last year. I know I was there. But when it came to so-called freedom marches that questioned the very existence of COVID-19, with no masks in sight, along with wild conspiracy theories about 5G technology that I just simply don't understand, well, it's a free country. People will make their protests and their voices heard, Scott said. Our right to peaceful assembly and association is a fundamental, a fundamental element of a functioning democracy and should be entrenched in any charter of rights. Untouchable, in fact. To the extent that it is inhibited, the power imbalance is increased and corruption festers. Speaking of which, <laughs> hey, a substantive Federal Integrity Commission is long overdue. And it's certainly on my very long and increasing checklist to guide where my vote is laid in a month's time. Unfortunately, there is not 
ample time tonight to list the ways in which public money has been abused with impunity in recent years. And real accountability means legal scrutiny and penalties. Politicians cannot be exempt from the same ethical expectations as any other industry. It's obscene to argue so. I hope you feel similarly. I personally simply cannot rationalise that any politician employed only to act in the public interest would possibly or could possibly be against the notions of accountability, transparency and integrity in the expenditure of public funds. <laughs> but there does seem to be a great many. <laughs> Though in need of improvement, Australia has one of the world's most effective public health schemes in Medicare, which of course was introduced by this centre's namesake, Prime Minister Bob Hawke in February 1984. <laughs> and which must be protected at all costs. There's a whole generation of young Australians who might not know that pre-Medicare, one of the highest factors in personal and non-business related bankruptcies, bankruptcies was medical care and hospital treatment. Private health insurance was prohibitively expensive, limited, and many had to go without, which meant a choice between financial or physical collapse. When I see the prohibitive cost of medical care in the largely privatised US system, for example, that entrenches deep economic and racial discrimination, I see at least one element of Australia's health system and social safety net that we can be very proud of. But access to adequate health care for the elderly is also a human right. And that has horribly deteriorated, as detailed by the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, in a sector which has had 18 inquiries or commissions since 1997, <laughs> and yet is still riven by patient-person abuse, such as physical and chemical restraints, and substandard care. The COVID pandemic exposed the lack of process understaffing and inadequate or non-existent training, and elderly infected patients were found to have been medicated and restrained rather than hospitalised. What sort of country does this to its elderly? Bring the provision of care for elderly Australians in line with international human rights norms and provide dignity for all. And how about Australians on JobSeeker? Uh, we're there again. I was disgusted to see both Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese refuse to commit to an uplift in JobSeeker to a level where any Australian can not only survive, which is impossible on 46 bucks a day, at around 40% below the poverty line, but live without housing and food insecurity, raise and provide for children, and retrain and undertake education while not having to worry about where the next meal or roof is coming from. Poverty is another front line in the endless culture wars we spoke about earlier, and like refugees, a trap waiting to catch any unsuspecting political candidate who demonstrates too much empathy for the impoverished. God forbid. Such is Australia in 2022. Nevertheless, keeping people in poverty as a supposed incentive to work is not policy, it's outright cruelty. And it's staggering that we allow it to continue. Every person has a right to housing, food and human dignity and every society has a responsibility to ensure these are provided. They should be at the front of the budget line, not the rear. I don't get it. A Charter of Rights would ensure that today's budget, whether in deficit or otherwise, can no longer be used 
as an excuse for leaving behind our most vulnerable and in need Australians. And crucially, we would have also seen our last election welfare scare. Now, wouldn't that be great? Put that behind us. <laughs> Australia is also in desperate need of social housing. Again, I'd like you to reflect on what sort of country we are, where hundreds of thousands of people, single parent families, and the fastest growing cohort of middle-aged women are homeless or struggle from short-term residence to another. Australia's social housing stock has barely risen in 20 years, while the population has grown by 33%. And whereas social housing constituted 6% of property stock in 91, today it's a shocking 4%. I fully support steps to overcome this deficit and see the provision of housing for every Australian. A basic requirement for any society to commit to. A commitment which should be non-negotiable, not even questioned actually, just provided. Women and girls have an inalienable right to equality, whether in education, access to training and the labour market, to be paid equally for their work and to services which make this attainable for primary caregivers, predominantly women, such as early childhood education and care. And yet, despite the initiation of the Sex Discrimination Act in 1984 and the Affirmative Action Equal Opportunity for Women Act of 1986, again, all under the Hawke government, Australia's gender pay gap persists at around 22%, so that for every $10 a male earns, a woman takes home around $7.72. Consider that women are overrepresented at the bottom of wage earners and men are twice as likely to earn $120,000 or more and it's clear that we simply don't have a strong enough commitment to gender equality. That's the evidence. Gender equality also means mechanisms to facilitate equal political representation, including cultural and racial intersectional, intersectionality, of course. And while I'm pleased to see initiatives such as Women for Election that aims to educate a new generation, all political parties should implement a quota to provide immediate access. I simply don't have the confidence that in a context where the Prime Minister repeatedly says, yes, women should be represented, but not at the expense of men, that change will happen quickly enough. <laughs> of the 10 countries with the highest percentage of women in their lower or single house of parliament, seven have implemented a quota system. Australia has just 31% of female lower house members, ranked 50th in the world. Since Julia Gillard was Australia's 27th prime minister between 2010 and 2013, how many women do you suppose have been elected to the highest political office around the world? The answer is 40. How great is that? Today, just one major Australian political party has a woman as leader or deputy, in this case, co-deputy of the Greens, Larissa Water, Waters MP. That's awful. That is awful. In the last 18 months alone, Sweden, Tunisia, Estonia and Samoa elected their first female prime ministers, while Tanzania, Honduras and Barbados chose female presidents. And I've seen the positive influence of a quota as former chair of Professional Footballers Australia, the Professional Players Union, which includes all of our professional players, the Socceroos and the Matildas. In the process of a governance review in 2016, a quota for female representation meant that for the first time, Matilda's players had a voice at governance level, which completely changed the conversations and perspectives. Completely. With outstanding management in intervening years and leadership from both female and male national teams, this began the journey to an announcement in 2019, three years later, of equal pay and conditions for both the female and male national teams. 
That decision played a significant role in the wonderful Matildas now being in a position to properly prepare for the FIFA World Cup on home soil next year. A tournament that we expect they may have a very solid chance to win. <laughs> Representation carries access and access means decision-making authority and I can only wonder what that means for the next generation of female football talents who will inherit a set of labour conditions that will set them up for success at the very highest level. It starts with one step. A Charter of Rights would also and certainly deal with the issue of incarceration and over-representation of Indigenous kids in the justice system, since no rights-respecting democracy can possibly think that locking children up as young as 10 is in any way acceptable. According to the UN Committee on Rights of the Child, the age of criminal responsibility that corresponds with psychosocial development is 14. Last year alone, 65% of the almost 500 children aged 13 and under who were imprisoned were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, a rate of 17 times non-Indigenous children, despite making up just 6% of the population aged 10 to 17. In a cycle that too often condemns the child to a carceral existence. The United Nations Committee on Racial Discrimination have rightly criticised our juvenile justice system as highly racialised. It is, in fact, racist. This is an issue of racial injustice and should be viewed that way. We need to urgently find ways to enable Indigenous-led community initiatives to overcome patterns that entrench disadvantage from generation to generation. And these principles should be enshrined in a Charter of Rights to protect the most vulnerable. I'm delighted to be part of a broader anti-racism movement in Australia and particularly a grassroots-led campaign called Racism Not Welcome for this reason. And as a white, Anglo, male, Australian, I understand the privilege and access to power and pathways that I've had throughout my life. And that as a member of the racial majority, I cannot allow Indigenous Australia or our minority communities to carry the load in educating the rest of us about the discrimination they face every day. Those with power, privilege and social capital must put our shoulder to the wheel to help lift up those without a voice and let them speak. <laughs> Nor should they act alone. Racism is one part of why I led a campaign called Save Hakeem several years ago now to free a young Bahraini refugee and football player from Melbourne from a Thai prison. As a member of the Australian Multicultural Council and acutely aware of the marginalisation at that time of our beautiful Muslim Australian community, who still, of course, face discrimination today, when Hakim al Arabi got himself into trouble at Bangkok Airport, not only did I know that football, and particularly FIFA, would never act for something as trivial as the life of a young player, but also that Australia would likely find it very difficult to care, particularly much of the media and that it would take careful management of the messaging to ensure that Hakim was given the optimal opportunity to be freed and back with his young wife in Australia. Sport provided an important shield for Hakim, and this is its power, particularly in a country like Australia, where it's such an important cultural institution. But so too was it important to show that a prominent member of the sporting and wider community was on his side. I've learned since that this is called allyship. Back in 2018-19, I simply called it a responsibility to help where we have the skills, experience and power to make a difference, whatever that positive difference might be. That experience and network of contacts around the world developed throughout the Save Hakim campaign has been very useful, such as late aug uh, last August, when we were able to evacuate the Afghan women's national football team from Kabul airport. <laughs> With the assistance of a team right around the world and of Immigration Minister Alex Hawke and Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, along with trusted members of parliament 
and friends, Nick McKim and Zali Stegel. I know there'll be many in the audience tonight who similarly played a role in getting people out in that chaotic and very sad situation where Australia left many behind. And I'm looking forward to the release of a new film this Friday night about 15 young Afghan girls of Tajik ethnicity who hid for several weeks in a single room while the Taliban searched house to house for them and eventually escaped to safety in Australia, aided by our Addison Road community organisation, a small community centre in Sydney. A harrowing story of courage and terror, die or die trying, escaping the Taliban, as it's called, is another example of Australians working together in solidarity with persecuted people around the world to overcome the incessant narratives about seeking asylum and recover our sense of shared humanity. <laughs> Unlike Mawa Mawin and the 14 others, when I was a young player, among many as or more talented, no one ever looked at the colour of my skin or my ethnicity and considered whether I should or should not be selected or allowed to attend school, for that matter, as the case for girls in Afghanistan today. I had no barriers other than hard work in my career from junior national teams to 29 games for the Socceroos. And this is simply not the reality for many young Australians today. We can use this privilege for our own benefit or for others. It's simply up to each of us. That's why I'm committed to ensuring that human rights are embedded in sport governing bodies to ensure that the slogans about inclusion, diversity and even anti-racism are real and that opportunity is genuinely for all, irrespective of any difference. We need to finally deal with our historical legacy of racism, understand how that has informed present day institutions and social structures and truthfully acknowledge frontier massacres and systemic disadvantage of indigenous peoples that is now centuries long. Informed and driven by Australians with lived experience of racism, the Racism Not Welcome campaign is working with local government associations to install Racism Not Welcome street signs as a physical demonstration of the community's stance and as an important catalyst for conversations and education about racism. This process has, has been wonderfully instructive. Whilst minority communities all around the country have shouted with joy and children written to say that they feel validated and heard even when they see an anti-racism sign in their local area, other councils and councillors have brought out the old trope that there's no need for signs because racism doesn't exist here. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly to companies or any other institutions, if you genuinely have a safe space for non-white Australians to speak about how they feel and their treatment about real access to decision makers and the corporate ladder, you'll hear a very different story, one that I hear every day. But truly safe spaces where our bias, prejudices and views can be challenged without recourse are very, very rare. Although the Australia LGA Council ratified the campaign over a year ago, one council in Sydney, Cumberland Council, refused to adopt the campaign for this very reason. There was no racism. One of Australia's most diverse councils with one of the highest proportions of Asian and Muslim Australians. And this came even as Chinese Australian councillor and friend of mine, Kun Huang, received a letter at that time with the most vile racial abuse imaginable. I just want to touch briefly again on the issue of non-discrimination on the grounds of sexuality, which is a human right, along with that of race, colour, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. It won't surprise anyone, I guess, that I oppose the recent religious discrimination bill proposed by the Morrison government on the basis that in a secular society, your and my religious freedom and observance is constitutionally protected. However, it is rightly balanced against other rights. Such as when religious beliefs cross into 
hate speech or vilification or where these beliefs lead to systemic discrimination against others and breach the central principle that I believe in of human equality. I respect all religions. However, the right of gay, lesbian or trans Australians to attend any school, institution, university or enjoy all this wonderful island has to offer should be no different to mine or yours in any way. A fair go, equality and egalitarianism that are an ongoing project, but one to be proud of nonetheless as Australians, all dictate that each of us has the same rights and in an ideal world, that would also be one less debate that makes our LGBTI community a lightning rod for division and too often hate. And that's not talked about enough. Before I leave you, it's important to recognise the assault on human rights in Australia that is undoubtedly a, re a reaction to successive governments being held accountable to refugee torture, Indigenous stolen generation and sexual misconduct, harassment and bullying in Parliament. All critically important work by the Australian Human Rights Commission. Earlier this month, the Global Alliance of Human Rights Institutions declined to re-accredit the Australian Human Rights Commission as an A-grade institution for the first time since accreditation was introduced in 1993 due to multiple appointments in the last 10 years that contravened an open merit-based process. This is extremely concerning, as is the shedding of one in three jobs due to inadequate funding at the Commission and demonstrates why an overriding commitment to a human rights respecting society is both so important and at present so challenging. While imperfect, I shudder to think where we'd be without the Human Rights Commission holding governments to account and it's vital that it's protected and adequately funded. In closing, I wanted to show you something. Recently, in speaking at the National Press Club, I made the point that racism, xenophobia and exclusion of non-white people throughout our history has been a feature of Australian society since pre-Federation and that refugees are simply the latest group to be used for political gain. Further, this period where we literally literally destroyed refugee lives, is perfectly encapsulated in the putrid boat trophy that sits in the Prime Ministerial Office. That's our office. As ugly in design as it is in meaning, <laughs> it symbolises hatred, suffering, death, and the degradation of Australia's humanity. That a Prime Minister would proudly proclaim the deaths and destruction of innocent lives as a victory, something to be celebrated and valorised, is appalling in the extreme and says too much about Australia today. I suggested humbly that in its place we might have a sculpture of an outstretched hand to, to signify support for all, anti-racism, a commitment to human rights, and a promise to the rest of the world that we consider ourselves a leading member of the global community, working to the betterment of humanity and, of course, the planet. Addison Road Community Organisation in Sydney, where I volunteer and am ambassador, a most wonderful haven of goodness and social justice that fills as many mouths as voids in our social structures, thought this a very good idea and arranged for one of Australia's foremost sculptors, Tim Silver, to create a physical manifestation of what we see as a new Australia. We will deliver this sculpture to the newly elected Prime Minister in late May, whoever that may be. With a strong request that the era of the boat trophy be consigned to an ugly period in Australia's history. 
never to be repeated. Never to be repeated. And that it is time for the open, collaborative, globally conscious and humane Australia that so many of us wish to see. This Australia has always been within reach. We might say that we just have to stretch out our hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Thank you. That's very nice. That's better than at the start. <laughs> that's a better clap than at the start, I was saying, so that's great. Thank you. I'm happy, I'm happy. Okay, should I go off? You, you, you can stay if you like, it's up to you. Um, so, uh, when I visited Bob shortly before he passed away, uh, I was in his office in Sydney, and on the table in his office were very, very few things. Um, one of the things he had on the table was um, his honorary doctor from the University of South Australia, and the other one he had was a photograph of Denise Bradley, my predecessor as the Vice Chancellor, with himself and Nelson Mandela, um, when Nelson received his honorary doctorate from UniSA. And um, the Mandela lecture was something that Bob used to do the vote of thanks for, so there are big shoes to fill. Um, and I, I don't have the accents to, or, or, or the, the charm to get away with it. Um, but it was incredibly important for Bob, and Bob used to speak a lot about what this series of lectures means and what the uh, Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre means. It's there on the banner and it gets brushed over. It's about strengthening democracy, it's about valuing diversity, and it's about building our future. And what Craig talked about tonight is fundamental to that, a charter of rights, which every civilised country should have, and which should be enshrined and should be lived. And the reason why the Hawke Centre is associated with the university is because universities don't seek truth. Right? They seek fact. Right? And the presentation of fact allows people to decide what's true and what's not true, because there's too many false truths and fake news in this society. When we put the best minds to work to find solutions and the intellectual firepower behind that to present it as fact, well then an argument can be created and people can understand the argument and they can make their decisions in a democratic society. Now, Craig has been relentless in his efforts to stop cruelty to asylum seekers and refugees. He's advocated for their release into a caring community and a community where their rights will be respected. He's worked tirelessly across a range of social programs from indigenous rights, self-determination, homelessness, climate action, and refugee advocacy. And as we learned, it's in the T-shirt, although I was trying to figure out what was on the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, that's the right. racism not welcome, right. yeah. He's a key driver between hashtag racism not welcome uh, by all LGAs Australia-wise to normalise acknowledgement and action against racism in Australia. And it's a critically important piece because it is a racist society. As someone who's an Australian uh, now by, as a citizen, it's amazing how casually racist we can be. And it's casual, which means it's actually endemic and ingrained and we have to overturn that. Through time, it will happen. Craig's voice is a voice for those whose cries are drowned out by our concerns for the everyday in our own society. And we thank him on behalf of the voiceless. We thank you for coming here tonight. We thank the center, uh, the Bob Hawke Center, Jacinta and all her staff. And I'd like you to once again acknowledge the tour de force that was Craig Foster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.